Good morning, church. Good to worship with you this morning. Let me um, share a few things with you. Uh, the, uh, one is in the bulletin and a couple are not. Um, first of all, we have set the day for the Christmas caroling. You'll notice that that's in, the, um, in your bulletin. It is Wednesday, the 20th of uh, December. Um, and everybody who is going caroling that evening, we would like to depart the um, church building at uh, 515. And then coming back, and there will be soup and refreshments and stuff for everybody to enjoy. So that's kind of an annual thing, and that date has been set. And please uh, note that on your calendars. I want to ask a question. How many of you are planning on coming Christmas Eve evening? Christmas Eve evening. Can I see your hands, please? OK, OK. You guys are singing, so I would assume. <laughs> I'm assuming you'll be here. You won't be like, okay, um, FaceTiming us or something like that. That would be awesome. All right, I just, I just wanted to. We have a, we have a. Uh, we're going to do something a little different on Christmas Eve. I think you'll really like it. It will combine the old with the new, and we will still sing hymns galore, and we'll hear from the choir. Uh, but there'll be something special about that service I think you'll really enjoy. If you have family or whatever, um, friends, it might be a, a, a cool thing to invite them to. It won't be the same old, same old. Let me just put it to you that way. I uh, spent uh, about 20 hours this last week working on it, and I'm about a fourth of the way through it. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through that, and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. Um, I wanted to let you know, um, it's in the bulletin, um, but Aileen Wilson has been uh, placed in uh, the Lutheran home, and uh, she really has no one to see her. And uh, she, you know, was obviously a major part of our congregation's life for 21 years, and she thinks very fondly of, of her connections here. So if you have an opportunity uh, to stop in and just say hi, um, I know she would really appreciate that. She, she, she really would. Um, little bird told me about all that, all right? So. And finally, I wanted you to know that there's something really cool going on in our community, and that is that this coming Saturday, the uh, restaurant Azul Tequila uh, is hosting uh, a meal, a hot meal for, uh, for the uh, community. Uh, it is a free meal for those who are hungry and those who are homeless. Authentic Mexican food, uh, their doors are open at 10 uh, until 1 o'clock. So if you know someone who would like to uh, uh, participate in that, I think it's amazing when a business just says, listen, we want to be a blessing uh, to those, particularly those, some of those who are less fortunate in our community and do this. They will also have a big box out in front and if you would like to uh, donate any gently used clothes or coats or hygiene items or toys or anything like that, if you would like to do that, that box will be there and you can put things in that. So when we have a business that's doing something like that, I think that's commendable and I think that we should show our appreciation uh, toward them in that. So if anybody, I'll have this up on the table. If you want any further details, you'll be able to see that, okay? Is there anything else that needs to be announced this morning? Yes, Carol. Yes, yes, on Christmas Eve, there will be our regular Sunday morning service. That will be the last Sunday of Advent. So we will actually, we'll close out Advent and we will actually end our service with a Christmas hymn. Okay? Get us all warmed up for Christmas. And then Christmas Eve will be our traditional, quasi-traditional uh, candlelight service with communion. Okay? So we're, we're having both services that day. Yeah, and that will be at 7. And let me just ask you a question. Would it be more convenient for us if we, in the future, move the time of that service up earlier 
to like say a 5.30 or a 6 whereby you'd be done and then have the rest of the evening with family or maybe even a 5 o'clock start or something like that to get it done possibly or even the beginning of it prior to things being dark. Is that something that would interest you? We're not going to make a decision. I'm not going to call for a vote or anything like that. If you're thinking about it, if you have some opinion, let them find their way to me or to one of the elders, okay? And uh, we will think about that. Because the way it's set up now on Christmas Eve, at 7 o'clock, it's kind of right in the middle. You either have to get an early meal and then scurry to church and then home, or like we have family things normally on Christmas Eve, and we're the last ones to arrive in any family thing because by the time we close the service out and get out of here, it's almost too late to be with family. So if there's a better way to accommodate that important service, we need to be open to that. Because we are very flexible here in how we do things. <laughs> any other announcements or questions? Let us begin our worship service. I call you to a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts for Advent. Amen. Join me in the call to worship. The eternal God who created all things calls us here to worship this day. Here in this place, the faithful are destined to find salvation. And here, the careless are summoned to be awakened. Here, the doubting may find faith. And here, the anxious are to be encouraged. Here, the tempted are invited to find help. And here the sorrowful are offered comfort. Here the weary may find rest. And here the strong can be renewed. Here the aged can find consolation. And here the young can be inspired. This is our invitation to worship the living God who sustains all things by the power of his word. May the God who abides with us through his Holy Spirit receive our worship and help us to celebrate our faith this day. Amen.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today we join with generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. Today's reading is Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cher cherubim, shine forth upon your people, stir up your might, and come to save us. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with our prayers? You have fed us with sorrow and made us drink tears by the bucketful. <coughs> Let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. When we see God's beautiful holiness, we are reminded of our own brokenness. God is light and truth, yet we live among shadows and lies. People of God, let us acknowledge who and whose we are. Let us ask our powerful God to illumine us with grace and truth in Jesus our Lord. Let us bring our brokenness before God and one another through our confession of sin. Love, 
We come before you to confess that we have preferred the ways of this world and our lives. We have rebelled against your commands and rejected your wisdom. We have turned our back to fatherly guidance and have gone lost together. Everywhere we turn, we are reminded of our ear-filled ways. O Lord God and Father, most gracious, filled with mercy and steadfast love, Hear us when we pour out our sorrows for you. Forgive us and give us and sorrows and pursuits. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In response to this great gift and the peace that, bring, that it brings, let us share God's peace with one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture. As we open these words today and hear from them, 
We ask for your divine grace and your help that we might receive them. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand those things that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading today is a traditional reading that comes on the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, today it is from the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens shall be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. And from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning lest he come suddenly and find you asleep and what i say to you i say to all stay awake this is the word of the lord well i love the season of advent if you read the newsletter article you know that i'm like its biggest fan you all have to suffer as a result of that because I don't normally budge a whole lot on the season of Advent because I think it's really important. Our confession this morning was a confession not necessarily for our own lives personally, although there's application, but the uh, season of Advent calls us to take the place, our place within our world and to offer up before God confessions of where our world is at. It invites us to see our world through different eyes. And so that being the case, you know, Advent not being about ourselves or not being about me or not being about us, it's about others. I find it just an incredibly important season that we need to really take heart of and note of and participate in. So we begin our Advent journey today. We'll have four weeks of what we call waiting. And it connects us to the longing that took place back in the day when the people of God were longing and waiting in horrible circumstances for the Messiah to come. It connects us to that. Also with the future and a longing of the waiting for our Lord and Savior to return again so that all things could be made right. So it is a connection to the longing and the desires of the past and the longing and the desires for the future, all having to do with a world that gets impacted by God. Every week in our service, or pretty much every week, we recite some form of the Apostles' Creed. In that Apostles' Creed, there's a phrase you say it every week. I don't know whether you believe it or not. You're supposed to. That's why we confess it. But it says this about our Lord Jesus Christ. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father from whence he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead. We say that every week. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ when he was resurrected ascended to the right hand where he sits at the right hand of the Father, he ascended to the throne, sits at the right hand of the Father, the place of power and authority, and from there he will come again, and when he does, he will judge the quick, or the living, and the dead. That is an essential foundation of our faith, the idea that Jesus will come again. He will come, and when he comes, 
He will set all things right. What was initially accomplished in his death and in his resurrection, where then he ascends to the Father, what was initially started there or inaugurated there gets completely fulfilled when Jesus comes a second time or again to bring complete healing and restoration to our earth. It is that belief, that expectation, that hope of Jesus coming again that makes faith vibrant. Without a hope of Jesus returning again, faith has a tendency just to become just a whole bunch of statements that we kind of believe or actions that we go through. But it is the expectant coming of our Lord that keeps faith alive. That's why Jesus is always in all of the parables it, as he gets to the end, is talking about people who stay ready. People whose faith, the switch is on because they're looking for our Lord to come again. Now, that doesn't have to be some radical thing, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. It just simply means that we hold out in a world that is broken. We hold out hope that it can be fixed. So let's look at our text. It is just a snippet of the entire 13th chapter of Mark, which is called the Little Apocalypse. I don't know if I agree with that or not, but that's what it's called. Apocalypse being kind of a view of, of things, a, a spiritual view, looking at, at things from a spiritual perspective. It's interesting because the whole text that we read to you this morning starts with a proclamation or kind of a question. The disciples look at Jesus and they say, look at that temple. Isn't it incredible? And you would look at it and you would say, yeah, it really is. The stones on the temple, you know, the temple took up, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the temple took up about a sixth of the whole city of Jerusalem. So, Here's this massive area called the temple, and all of the stones were white. So when the sun beat on it, it was like this radiant uh, structure that just glistened with the glory of God. And the disciples look at it, and they're proud of it. They're kind of like people of Napoleon in our church building here. You're proud of it. You know, people come. When we came into the town and we were looking to buy a home, the realtor that took us around, she said, well, I don't need to take you by the Presbyterian church. I said, what do you mean? She said, I take everybody who's new to the community by the Presbyterian church because it's one of the things we're most proud of in our community. She said, you know all about that, though. So I didn't have to go on the tour of the church, see it. That's kind of the way the disciples were with Jesus. And Jesus looks at them and just simply says, it ain't going to last. There's not going to be one stone left on top of another. What a rude thing to say. He just kind of squashed this moment of feeling good with a grim statement of the temple's demise. In the year 66 AD, there were four emperors of Rome, if you can imagine. It'd be like having four presidents in one year. The upheaval that took place in the Roman Empire started with Nero. He was a, just a beast, a wicked, wicked man. Put, I believe he was the one that put uh, Paul and Peter to death. And then there are two others that were not, not well known. And then it ends up with an emperor by the name of Vespasian. And he was the fourth emperor in that year of 66, and he had a son by the name of Titus, son-in-law, who was a general in the Roman army, and it was in that year that Titus laid siege to the temple and to Jerusalem, and for three and a half years, the temple and Jerusalem was under siege. They estimate that in that siege that ultimately destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem completely, Somewhere between 9 and 10 million Jews died. It's larger than the Holocaust of World War II. It was a horrible thing. It was the thing that everything was pointing to in all of, most all of the apocalyptic language of the day. Jesus tells his disciples of the temple's demise. It's going to happen, and it did, historically, within one generation. That's the time frame. This generation will not pass away till this stuff is seen experienced. 
And it's interesting in that because Jesus begins all of that right after he explains the temple being destroyed. He says, I want you to stand firm in your faith and I want you to not be afraid when you begin to hear rumblings about all of this. Well, that seems like Jesus, doesn't it? Telling, telling his, his uh, truest disciples, I want you to be full of faith. I want you to just, all right? And then Jesus says, when you actually begin to see it, the abomination of desolation, etc., I want you to run. He says, I want you to flee. And I want you to pray as the destruction begins. So Jesus begins by telling his disciples to stand firm in their faith. And then all of a sudden there's a command given that you need to flee because Jesus understands that the judgment that is about to occur is going to be horrendous. And what's interesting historically is that there was a, a prophetic utterance that was given by, I believe it was Eusebius, to the church. And the church, most all of the church, fled Jerusalem and were not then destroyed in the midst of this massive holocaust. It was, it was an amazing thing. So they took Jesus' advice and they did. And then Jesus said, you're going to have an awareness of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now we have a tendency to think that this means that Jesus is going to descend down out of heaven in the clouds and we're going to see him visually. But really the idea is Jesus in the clouds is the picture of Jesus actually ascending. He's ascending to the throne of God, to the right hand of the Father, as we confess, where there is power and there is authority. What is Jesus talking about? Understand that this was written to a group of people back during this time. We're not sure if the people received this gospel before the destruction of Jerusalem or afterwards, but it's all beginning to unfurl about then. And people are wondering, what difference does Jesus make? What did Jesus really accomplish? Because it appeared as though Jesus lost. If you think about it, all of the powers and all of the political structures and the religious power, they all teamed up on Jesus and they killed him. They put him to death. It seems as though they won. And then there's this little thing called the resurrection where Jesus is raised from the dead. And that would tend to suggest that those people that put Jesus to death, they didn't win. Jesus won. He was put to death, but now he's alive again. The Father has raised him from the dead. We call that his vindication, but it's an interesting vindication. He is who he says he is. He didn't lose, but that vindication is known only to a few, and it's known primarily in secret. He only appears to his immediate followers, and the resurrection, as far as the world understood, it never happened. Those who were responsible for the death of Jesus made sure that the resurrection story of Jesus was somehow uh, 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 just made inconsequential. There was rumors that went around about people that robbed the grave. Soldiers that were there that witnessed the resurrection were sworn to silence. All in an effort to keep this vindication of Jesus from making being public. But now we're talking about Jesus in the clouds and we're talking about a second vindication. The first one was to the insiders, this one's to the outsiders. When Jerusalem is destroyed and all of those who were responsible for putting Jesus to death Jesus and what he says and what he stood for is vindicated. They, only, they not only did not win in killing the Son of God, but Jesus is correct in his judgment upon them. The vindication, he is made out to be the one who is right. So Jesus moves through this, these words and then he gives us a time frame of a generation, but he says, you don't know really when it's going to happen. Just keep alert, keep awake. And as we read our text in the last three verses, there are three times that Jesus says, keep alert or keep awake. Keep awake. That's the preaching point of the text. Keep awake. 
keep alert. It was an amazing story. I mean, because I asked the question, what does it mean to keep awake or keep alert as Christians? We're called to keep awake, called to keep alert. What do you mean, Jesus? It was an amazing story I ran across. And uh, as, I, as I was uh, thinking about it, it was, it was just so applicable to our text today. Back in, in one of the world wars, I don't remember which one it was, the story is told because at the time there was a reliance upon the Morse code. And the story was told of the Department of Defense issuing um, an opening for people to come and be these people that would handle Morse code so that they could communicate. And so the summon was put out, the job was posted, and the applicants came into the, the area where they are to be interviewed to see if they're going to be the ones selected for this position. So here this gentleman walks into this room and here's all these people sitting in there waiting to be called. They're waiting for their interview to take place. And so he has a seat among all of them and he sits there and everybody is waiting. And they're waiting patiently. And they wait some more. And they continue to wait. And all of a sudden he noticed that there was a rhythmic little impulse going on in the background. And he began to take note of it. And all of a sudden he realized it was Morse code. And the code said the first one who comes into the office will be the one who was awarded the job. So he gets up. And he walks into the interviewer's office and he is hired for this strategic job and he walks out into the room and he says, I've been hired, I'm the one. And they all looked at him and said, but what about us? You see, there's two kinds of waiting. There are people who just wait. If it were me in there, I'd be playing with my smartphone, waiting. <laughs> and then there was somebody who was waiting, who as he waited, he was listening. He was aware. He was responding. And what he heard moved him to where he needed to be. I think when Jesus calls us to wait, he has that in mind. The text we read this morning actually happened, but it is a foretaste of what will befall our world. What happened in the past, in part, will happen in fullness when Jesus comes again. And as the disciples were called to be alert and to keep awake, so are we. But what are we to keep alert and awake towards? To me, I think it's something that's very obvious. We are to be aware and alert to those things that oppose God, oppose the purposes of God, oppose what Jesus stands for, those things that Jesus is going to judge. When God calls us to be awake and alert, he calls us to wait and observe. The very things that opposed Jesus in the beginning, that he triumphed over in the judgment of which he spoke in Mark 13, those very things are still alive and well in our world today. And those things that opposed him then still oppose him. And when he comes, he will deal with all of that. I think the opposite of all of this on being awake is a word we call complacency. You know that word. It's where you just exist. It is a room full of applicants waiting to be interviewed who are just complacent. If you become complacent about anything that's important, it will die. If you become complacent about a relationship, complacent about your health, complacent about justice in our world, or complacent about the grace of God, or complacent about faithfulness to God, anytime you become complacent, all of a sudden, that which is important shrinks and we become of no use, either in our relationships with one another or with the things of God. So what are we to be alert to? 
Well, perhaps I, I would just say it this way. Those things that oppose Jesus, well, what are those? Well, there's, there's several things that I took note of as I was thinking about. There are societies and institutions. Societies are groups of people who live together uh, in an ordered community. And so you have to ask yourself, well, how are, how are things ordered in our society? Or institutions or organizations that have been established for a particular cause or program. So you ask yourself, what are those causes or programs that this institution represents? There are things that oppose Jesus in the area of structure or policy. How we organize ourselves. The actions that we are uh, called to take in policies or their prejudices and oppressions. All of those things oppose Jesus. There was an interesting article I was reading this week because it's becoming such an issue we can't ignore it anymore. It was an article written by one of my favorite uh, uh, follows that I, that I have. And it was talking about why preachers need to stay out of the arena of politics. Well, I don't need any encouragement on that. I've never tried to enter into that realm, or I did in my early days. I still have the scars to show when I entered into that. And I also have the sense of, of struggles that resulted as uh, you know, doing that. But the reason that this person said that we are not called to enter into the area of politics, and by the way, there's a new bill that's to be passed or looking at being passed whereby churches now can align themselves and pastors can become voices of politics, trying to tear down that wall. If that happens, woe be to us. It's, it's a fascinating thing how we think that the freedom to do all of that is actually going to help us, but it, it, it's just an incredibly harmful a thing that they're looking at doing. This person said the reason why we're called to stay out of that is because you, we as pastors are called to represent the ideal and the ultimate. And politics by its very nature deals with the real and does whatever is necessary to deal with it. It can't be the ideal and it can't be the ultimate. There's no political strategy or political party that can bring in the ultimate or the ideal. So we're called that. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, it is, the greatest, it is the greatest amount of warfare that we go through in the ministry. The, the greatest amount of discouragement that we face in the ministry is we are called to the ideal and to the ultimate. We see that from the scriptures. We, we, we embody that as we study God's word and it forms in our hearts. We see that. We see what the church is called to be ideally. What the ultimate expression of Christ on this earth is to be. And then we have to deal with reality. And the difference between those two are haunting. The reality is so far below what the ultimate or the ideal is. And to live in that space where you're constantly seeing the ideal and constantly seeing the ultimate, but constantly being forced into living in the real. It is broken. It, it, it forms the greatest struggle we have as ministers. So I got to thinking, without being political this morning, or lying with some political ideology, what is it that I'm alert to? What is it when I look at our world that I try to see? What are the things that I look out here of Jesus that I try to be awake and alert to? Let me just share a couple of those with you. First of all, my world lens that I'm alert to in Advent especially, I am alert to a society that values human life above all other ideas and endeavor. I value a society in which human life is the most highly valued thing. All the way from the unborn in the womb of the mother to every person, to the elderly, who seemingly has no viable purpose in our world anymore. Human life is precious. Whether that person is a person with a different race, a different religion, a different status. All life is to be valued within the society 
that is constructed or that holds the ideals of Jesus. So when I see anything in our world that devalues life in any form, that causes great concern to me. Number two, I am alert to a society that is ordered around equal opportunities and rights for every person and values that more than accumulating and preserving wealth, power, and privilege. I believe that a culture that is not opposed to Jesus is a culture that is concerned especially about those who have less or who come from less, or whose voices are less. It is concerning to me that, uh, that any nation would consider its greatness in terms of economic or military power. Since when does more money in my wallet make me a better person? Society must be a society, a group of people who hold to the ideal that every person is valuable and every person should have the same opportunities. In the last five or 10 years, there have been a number of movies that have just stirred my heart. Perhaps you'll remember the movie called The Help or you'll rem remember the movie called Hidden Figures which just came out a year or so ago. I couldn't help but break down weeping when I saw the movie 42, the Jackie Robinson story. I watched Amistad, the movie, one time and I could never bring myself to watch it again. I remember watching for the first time the movie We Are the Titans, high school football team. And then I watched the movie Glory Road. All of those have to do with the struggles of a nation, a society of people who view people of a certain color as not being valuable and not having the rights and privileges of everyone else. It is hard to watch. It is hard to understand how any people could be like that. So when I'm alert, I'm alert for those sort of things. What else am I alert to? I'm alert to a society in which all people have access to the basics in life. What do we need? What, not what we want, what do we need as people to survive? I think we need food and shelter. We need medical care and we need education. There has to be a society in which those things are not available based on what somebody has or who somebody is. It is available, the basics, the essentials, of whatever life is, whatever you want to term that, I am alert to those things. And when I see those being safeguarded, it bothers me. I have so many things I'd like to share with you, but are, I, can't, I, I just can't. Listen, I grew up just a little, not too far from a school district called Spencer, Spencer Sharples. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of it or not. It's a school system that exists between Swanton and Sylvania, up on the north, Swanton to the west, Anthony Wayne to the south, and Springfield to the east. It was a school system that was carved out of that because nobody wanted it. And the reason nobody wanted the people there is they were all black. They were all African Americans. They were all low income. Right out in the middle of this, of this area uh, that's all wooded and everything like that, you drive out there to it. And here's this thing. And this school system was carved out and put there. It was the poorest school system in the state of Ohio. Swatton said, we don't want them. Springfield said, we don't want them. Anthony Wayne said, no way. So Payne said, not happening here. So this little, little tiny group people had their own school. It was poor. The people coming through the system did not get the education that those in Swanton, Sylvania, Springfield, and Anthony Wayne got. We could do that because we didn't value human life or equal opportunities or access to the basics of life. When I look and I'm alert, that's what I'm seeing. I'm looking for society that's ordered around respect for each other and compassion and generosity and character and forgiveness. 
it's harder and harder to find. The lack of genuine respect for those who we disagree with is just about non-existence. I mean, it just, it just, it just permeates everything. We have very little of it. Compassion, integrity. And I think I also look for a society that is self-aware. And in its self-awareness, it is, has a humility towards God rather than some sense of national pride or boasting. Those are things I look at. And when I see things happening that come against those things, it concerns me greatly. Because I know that when our Lord Jesus comes back, all of those things that I, that, that I hold dear, you don't have to hold them dear, but I hold them dear, all of those things will be exalted. They will be raised up. Because that's what Jesus was about. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus rose again. That's why Jesus is coming back. Keep alert. Keep watch. I pray that you do that through this season. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these words, words given to us, words shared with us, words that we are called to embrace and to take. Help us to receive them. Help us to live them. Help us to believe that what we've heard is believed in such a way that we can honor you above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Toria. Would you join me now as we profess our faith with the specific emphasis on hope? Our God is a God of hope. God called our world into being, filled it with life and commanded it to flourish. God renews it through Jesus Christ. God governs it by the Spirit. God's world was created and is sustained in hope. Jesus Christ is the hope of God's world. In his death, the justice of God is established. Forgiveness of sin is proclaimed. In his resurrection, death was defeated. New life has come. God's purpose for the world was sealed. We are a people of hope. In this age, the Holy Spirit is with us, calling nations to follow God's path uniting people through Christ in love. In the age to come, God will renew the world through Jesus, who all things unrighteous out, purify the works of human hands, and perfect their fellowship in divine love. Christ will wipe away every tear. Death shall be no more. There will be a new heaven and a new earth and all creation will be filled with God's glory. Amen. This time, if our ushers would wait on our people, we will receive our morning offering.
prayer. Ever-present God, with this offering, we also present ourselves with all that we have been, all that we are, all that we shall become, and our resolve to walk in your way. Accept us and our offering, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. The season of Advent is here. It is waiting, as we've talked about. It is waiting in hope of God's powerful renovation of our world. It is waiting for peace to reign in place of fear and chaos. It is waiting for the time when the joyful expectation of new life is finally known. It's waiting for the day when God's love floods the earth. As we wait at this table, we wait hoping to taste a little bit of those things. This table offers us a foretaste of hope and peace and joy and love that will be ours when our Lord Jesus comes again. With that, I invite you to our table. Let us sing Spirit of the Living God as we prepare to receive our communion. thanksgiving to God. O oh Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe, in the very beginning you created all things and offered hope for generous life, lived in abundance within your goodness. The earth, enshrouded in bondage to darkness and chaos, was brought to order and shalom prevailed. All creation rejoiced as the wonder of life broke through the chaos, and the stars danced, and the mountains and hills sang, and the trees clapped their hands as joy prevailed. Into your image you created us with loving hands, you molded us, and breathed into us the intimate breath of your spirit. Therefore, we join our voices with all of the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. When our sin and rebellion shattered your creation, when all hope was gone and when peace gave way to fear and chaos brought about darkness, when joy was lost to heartache and despair and love's powerful influence became threatened, you sent forth your own son to restore the foundations that had been destroyed. He lived, he died, and he rose again to bring us an abundant life full of hope, peace, joy, and love. And so as we stand before this table, we're reminded once again that our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. And when he comes, he will judge our world in righteousness and all things will become new. And therefore we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Jesus, Lord, 
pour out your spirit once again so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling and those who have needs. We are mindful of little Brianna Fury and those that you place upon our hearts this day that we carry with us. We lift them now before your throne. Now may we and all of your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope awaiting your promised salvation. Gather your whole church, O oh Lord, into the glory of your kingdom, and let us join together now in the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our table is now open.
the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Amen. Who are those that are extending our communion today? Bob and Sandy, thank you so much for doing that. Let's pray for them. Almighty God, as these are sent forth bearing these holy gifts, we ask that those who receive from them may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. Amen. Thank you for doing that, both of you. Let's pray. Loving God, you give, we give you thanks for uniting us by the baptism in the body of Christ and filling us with the joy through the Holy Supper of our Lord. Now that we've tasted the banquet you prepared for us in the world to come, strengthen us that we may one day share together the inheritance of the saints and the life of the heavenly city. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. bless you. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May we be a people who stay awake, who stay alert, who watch and who wait for the coming of our Lord. Go in peace for we are. Amen.